Hello everyone. Glad you could be here today, whether you're joining us online or you're here in the building. Uh, believe it or not, this week I am not in the building. Some things happened in our family that meant I needed to stay home. Uh, so I was talking to Pastor Randy about it and uh, I told him that I could still preach because I was on the docket to preach this week. Uh, I'd just record it and then edit the video and make sure it was on the, the computers here at the church ready to go so that you could all still have the message this morning. And uh, Pastor Randy was good with it. So here we are. Um, the irony of all this is that um, I'm actually talking about, we're going to be exploring expectations this week. And how do we respond when things don't quite go the way we planned or anticipate, uh, which is which is pretty ironic. You see, when, when we have good expectations, when we're expecting good things and, and those expectations are met, it can give us a lot of hope and a lot of joy. Uh, like, for example, when I was a kid and uh, living with my parents, my mom had this poem that she would recite all the time, and she uh, would frequently recite it when we were on holidays, vacationing somewhere. The poem... Uh, my earliest memory of the poem, my mom reciting the poem, was me asking what the poem meant. And my mom proceeded to uh, tell me what the poem meant and why, why she was telling it. Uh, the poem goes like this. Red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. And then my mom proceeded to tell me, explain what it meant. That, you know, it, uh, red sky at night means that you're likely going to have good weather the next morning. But if you have a red sky in the morning, like when the sun's rising and the, it's a red sky, it usually means that there's bad weather coming, probably by tomorrow. It's not going to be a very, it's going to be kind of a yucky day. Now, we were on holidays when my mom would ask this, would tell us this poem. And when we would ex ask for the explanation, she would say, she would, she would give us the explanation and then she would proceed with a question. And she would say, so what does that mean about our day tomorrow? And me and my sister would answer, well, well, it means good weather. And my mom would be like, yeah, we're going to have good weather about tomorrow. How great is that? And then she would proceed to say, and so because we're having good weather tomorrow, it means you're going to have a lot of fun tomorrow and a lot of adventures tomorrow. So go to bed now. <laughs> and she would have us, uh, that was her way of um, building up our expectations so that we were excited about the day to come, but also building up our expectations so that we would go to bed and get some rest so that we were ready for the next day. Um, it, uh, it mostly worked, <laughs> uh, but sometimes our we can have uh, similar experiences and expectations with God, right? I don't know if this re resonates with you at all, um, but I've had many moments in my life where I've started praying to God, asking for him for help in a certain area or asking him for guidance or asking him for whatever it might be that I feel I need in that moment. And I'm praying and I might even accompany the prayer with a little bit of fasting, um, and I'm searching the word and trying to glean uh, truth from scripture to help me help guide my ways and uh, build, create reasonable expectations for God. And, and so I'll have an expectation of how I think God's going to work in a situation. And um, as things unfurl and unfold, the situation doesn't unfurl nor unfold the way I expected. And it can leave you with a fairly disgruntled feeling, an uncomfortable feeling, a feeling of distress even. When we have good expectations and God doesn't seem to meet those expectations, he seems to do something different or go in a different direction or, or encourage us to engage with him in a new way. It can be unsettling. And today I want to explore a piece of scripture in Luke chapter 7. So if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn there, Luke chapter 7. That highlights for us what John the Baptist, uh, how John the Baptist engaged with this. When he encountered God doing something that, that John the Baptist wasn't expecting. You see, it all starts in, in the beginning of the book of Luke, right? Uh, John the Baptist's story is very much woven into the gospel story of Jesus and the gospel of Luke. In fact, Luke doesn't actually start his gospel with the birth narrative of Jesus. He actually starts it with the birth narrative of John and then weaves that narrative into the story of Jesus. And when we get to John cha or Luke chapter 3, 
when you get to Luke chapter 3, you start zoning in on John the Baptist's ministry. And you start zeroing in on what he's doing and what he's teaching. And, he, and you find out he's baptizing people at a river named Jordan in the, middle, in the middle of nowhere, out in the wilderness. And as he's baptizing people, he's also preaching and he's teaching. And one of the things that he's preaching and teaching is he's calling people to repent from their sins. And this was actually very much a similar message to what Jesus pre preached and taught. He also called people to repent from their sins and to turn to God. John the Baptist nuanced things just a little bit in a slightly different direction than Jesus. Because he called people to join the kingdom of God, to, to get out of the kingdom of darkness, to join the kingdom of God, to join the kingdom of light, because there's a, the day of the Lord was coming. There's a day coming of judgment, of fire, of God's wrath, divine wrath that was coming upon the world. And it was wrath and righteousness and, and judgment that was falling, like, right, right? Like John talks about how the Lord's getting ready to thresh. He's getting ready to cut things down, repent, turn away, be part of God's kingdom before the one who comes, the one who is greater than I, the one whose feet I don't even deserve to touch before he shows up because he's going to come baptizing with the spirit and with fire. I'm just baptizing with water. He's going to become baptizing with so much more. He's going to bring the righteous wrath of God, which will fix the world. It'll fix the world. It'll, it'll fix everything. Now, John isn't being completely misguided here because that, that's actually one of the hopes of the Old Testament prophets is that a day would come called the day of the Lord where God would dispense his, right, his righteous wrath. And, and he would actually, through that wrath, through that judgment, through that justice, would actually fix the world. And it's actually how our Bibles end with the book of Revelation. It places this hope in this moment, this day of the Lord, where God will finally say, enough! And he will dispense divine justice and judgment to fix the world, <laughs> to renew it, to restore it, to refresh it. And once he creates a new heaven and a new earth, he will live here on the new heaven, in the new earth. He will bring the two together. They will become one. They will be just as they were intended to be back in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. A place of beauty and harmony. A place where God would dwell with his people. And so that's what John the Baptist is expecting for Jesus. John the Baptist is expecting that Jesus would roll out the divine, the divine kingdom of God here on earth and dispense the divine just, judgment and wrath of God to fix the world. That God would bestow Israel with the kingdom and has set up a kingdom that would take on all the other kingdoms and establish the peace of God over the world by fixing everything. John the Baptist was expecting it too. So I got to wonder what it was like for John the Baptist when Jesus finally showed up to be baptized. And, and John the Baptist had a front row seat as Jesus is going under the water and coming up out of the water to see heaven open up. To see, the, watch the Holy Spirit descend upon Jesus and empower him for ministry. To hear the voice of the Father declare, this is my son whom I love. In him, I am well pleased. I gotta wonder how excited was John the Baptist in that moment. This is the one we've been waiting for. He's finally here. He's finally gonna roll out God's kingdom. This is awesome. This is great. Let's do this. But how surprised do you think John was when Jesus disappeared and went into the wilderness to be tested by Satan? Nobody heard from him for over a month. He was silent. Maybe John the Baptist thought that, okay, okay Jesus probably has some preparations to, to get ready for the kingdom, right? He, he's got to get the armies ready. Maybe he's got to get some allies. He's got to figure out where the first skirmish is going to be, right? Where is he going to establish his geopolitical center, right? He, yeah, he's got big plans. I'm, I'm sure Jesus is on it. It'll, it'll work out okay. But then, but then he catches whispers. He catches murmurs. He catches rumblings that Jesus has come back. But he didn't go to Jerusalem, the geopolitical center of Israel. 
the, where the temple was and all the religion, the heartbeat of Israel was in Jerusalem. He went to the fringes. He went to the edges. He went back to his hometown, Nazareth, in the region, in the area of Galilee and Capernaum. And, and, and he's been preaching and teaching in synagogues there. Yeah, he's been doing some miraculous things. He's been performing some miracles, and it sounds like he's teaching about the kingdom of God, but, but John's got to be wondering, but I'm preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God. Why are you doing it too? And, 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 and why? I thought you were supposed to be a divine king establishing your kingdom. Well, what, what's going on? And, and it's not that Jesus didn't teach about the kingdom. He taught a lot about the kingdom. I mean, we've looked at some of those passages in Luke over the last few months. Jesus is unpacking what the kingdom of God is about, what it's like, the new wine, right, that God wants to give us. And he, he even talks, as you keep reading through Luke, Jesus will talk about how the kingdom of God, it's here, it's come, and yet it's not yet. But it's not yet. It's almost like Jesus was teasing to that day of the Lord, that, that moment when God, where God would say, enough, and fix everything. And he was teasing it. He, he was giving us tastes of it by showing us, right? In, in Nazareth, Jesus preached from the prophet Isaiah. And he talked about how the Spirit of the Lord has come upon me to preach good news to the poor and to set the captives free. And through the, cha through the chapters 4, 5, 6, and now 7, we're seeing what that freedom means. We're seeing what that proclamation of good news to, to the poor is all about. And it's all about the kingdom. So it's not that Jesus wasn't focused on the kingdom of God. He very much was. And he was building it, but he was building it in a way that John did not expect. And he was saying that the kingdom of God was here, but not yet. It's come among you, but it's not here yet. Paradox. I love it. I love it when, Bible, when the Bible has paradoxes. It's so good. You can only imagine that the straw that broke the camel's back was what was read during the service at the beginning of Luke 7. The story of Jesus healing the servant of the centurion, right? Think about that. The, this is a centurion. The, the, this guy's job is to ensure that the rule and authority of Rome is secure over the entire region. This man literally represents the enemies of the kingdom of God as the way John sees it. They are the kingdom opposed to God's kingdom. And he helps that kingdom of darkness, at least in John's mind. And I can only imagine how surprised John the Baptist was when he got wind that Jesus had healed the servant of a Roman centurion. How confusing that would have been. Wait, but that's the wrong side, Jesus. Come on, the kingdom of God. You're, you're supposed to be establishing your authority, your power, your dominance. Not only that, but think about the widow's son that Jesus raises to life that we also read about, right? He, he raises this random widow, this nameless widow, right? brings her son back to life. And you got to wonder, I mean, I mean, that's a great skill to have, right? Amazing to be able to resurrect soldiers during a skirmish, right? Bring them back to life and keep, so they can keep on fighting. You, you'd be unbeatable. You'd be unstoppable. But, but Jesus isn't resurrecting soldiers. Or to bring back generals, right? Think of some of the great generals that we have that, that are discussed in the Bible. Saul, David, Joab, all these. Joshua, these incredible men of God who understood tactics and formations and how to engage the enemy. Like You could have brought back one of those guys. But he doesn't. I mean, Samson. Samson would have been great to have around in a, in a brawl. <laughs> with all his power and might. Jesus doesn't bring back to anybody with power, with might, with authority. This, this, this young man has no economic influence, power. He's got no money. He's got no wealth. He's got no, doesn't seem to have any social credit. He's the son of a random widow. Jesus brings, back him, brings him back to life. Not only that, but back up again to the centurion, because Jesus also makes a declaration about the faith of the centurion. Do you remember that? He said that this centurion, this Gentile, this, this enemy of the kingdom of God, has more faith in God than anybody else he's encountered in all of Israel. Man! That must have stunned for John to hear, and it must have made things really confusing for him, because this, none of this, the way that Jesus is rolling out the kingdom of God, 
is not at all what John the Baptist was expecting. So what do we do in those moments where we don't know what to do with the things that God is doing? Well, let's, let's turn to Scripture now. Look at verse 18 in chapter 7. John's disciples told him about all these things, so everything that we've just talked about. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who's to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? I love what John does. John does two things here. John does two things here. You see, when we encounter a God who does the unexpected, the first thing that God wants us to do is confront him with our doubt. The first thing that God wants us to do is confront him with our doubt. That's exactly what John the Baptist is doing. He has the audacity to send disciples to Jesus to ask one question. Are you really the one we're waiting for? Are you really the Messiah? Are you really him? How cool is that? This is modeled all throughout scripture, by the way. The Old Testament saints do this over and over and over again. First Kings chapters 18 and 19 are one of my favorite examples of this with Elijah. He asks the same question multiple times and God lets him, right? Habakkuk, same sort of thing. He asks God a question about doubt. Abraham does it. Moses does it. David does it. All these great men of the faith did it. Women of the faith too. They all confront God with their doubt. When, they're conf- when they find themselves engaging with a God who does the unexpected. So when God does the unexpected, we confront him with our doubt. But then we have to do something else with that. John doesn't go to Jesus directly, does he? He sends disciples. John hasn't been arrested yet. That's coming. But he, so he's likely still performing ministry in the Jordan, in the middle, middle of nowhere. It would have taken time for disciples to travel from the Jordan where John was ministering up into and find, track down Jesus in in Galilee and find him and ask him his question. And then it would have taken time to get back to John. So John, when we, John models for us that when we confront God with our doubt, we then need to wait for his truth, which is the other thing that we see all these Old Testament and New Testament saints doing. When they confront God with doubt, they then wait for his truth, right? It's not just enough to to throw everything out on God and to dump on God with all of our questions. We then need to wait for him to answer with his truth. So when when we find a God who does the unexpected, we confront him with our doubt, then we wait for his truth. And sure enough, Jesus gives John his truth, a truth that he needs to hear. Let's read on to see what Jesus does. With the question. At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is being proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. I love Jesus' answer because he's actually paraphrasing scripture. He's paraphrasing what I kind of referenced at the beginning, that passage from Isaiah about Jesus, uh, the Messiah showing up to set the captives free and to proclaim good news to the poor. But, But Jesus is unpacking it. He's going into more detail, right? When you read that passage, it, do, it talks about the blind receiving sight and the lame walking, yes, but it doesn't say anything about lepers being cleansed or the dead being raised. But he does talk about the good news being proclaimed to the poor. So Jesus is reorienting John to Scripture. He's reorienting John back to his truth. And he's giving John a new perspective, a new expectation. Jesus wasn't saying that the kingdom of God wouldn't come in wrath someday. He's not saying that. He's just saying that the purpose of the kingdom of God right now is to give people a taste of the renewal. It's to give people a a taste of the new thing that God wants to do. It's to give people a taste of what the new creation is going to be all about. It's going to be good. It's going to be fantastic. It's going to be great. He wants people to put their hope in that, in the future restoration of all things, and recognize, be drawn into this kingdom of God that has a future goal to restore all things. Here's the thing, though. There's going to be, there, are, there will be some things that will remain broken in this world. Not everything is going to be fixed right away. 
But there's a day, but every once in a while, Jesus, God, will give us a taste. He'll give us a miracle. He'll give us a healing. He'll give us an answered prayer that'll give us a taste of that coming kingdom, of that restoration, full-on restoration and renewal. He'll give us a taste of it, and it'll be a good taste. It'll be a good taste. But you see, Jesus recognizes that the king, the time for that renewal hasn't quite come quite yet because he still has to go to the cross. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be unpacking the Easter story. We're going to be walking through the story of the crucifixion and talking about uh, revisiting all of those stories and those images that we have there to remind us what is our faith about. You see, Jesus in the book of Luke was not surprised by death. He knew that that was his purpose. He knew that in order to ultimately free people, he had to deal with sin and he had to deal with death. That's what the cross and the grave are all about. Jesus paying for our sin, paying for our rebellion against God, paying for the ways that we broke the world and the ways that we sought to build kingdoms separate from God's kingdom. That all has to get paid for. And once that's paid for, then Jesus deals with death so that we don't need to fear it by dying on the cross and rising again, coming back to life. He takes away the sting of death so that it has no hold over the people of God anymore. We need not fear it. We need not fear it. So you see, are you starting to get a sense now what we do when when we encounter a God who does the unexpected? When we counter God who does the unexpected, the first thing we have to do is confront him with our doubt. After we confront him with our doubt, we wait for his truth. And once we receive his truth, we embrace it. We embrace it. But there's a lot of people around Jesus when this conversation is happening. You can kind of get a sense of that. Look around you. Look at all the people who are being healed and restored, right? And I gotta, I, I, there, there's this wonderful thing that God does every so often where he will preemptively deal with our doubts. He doesn't do it all the time. But maybe you've had a moment like this where God will remind you of a truth or he'll give you something that you need. Um, but you don't realize you need it quite yet. And you're just wondering, okay, God, yeah, I agree with that. That's great. And you're wondering, why are you reminding me of that now? And then you wait a few days, right? And then all of a sudden it clicks. And you're like, ah, that's why I needed to. Be reminded of love for my enemies because one of them is just resurfaced, right? (laughs) uh, God does this all the time for us, can do this all the time for us. And I am so grateful when he does. And I can can see that Jesus is kind of trying to get ahead of it a little bit. And and there are probably people there, as we're going to read, there were people there who had been baptized by John. So there are people there who likely knew these disciples and would recognize them and would hear the question and think, what, John's doubting? But I was baptized by John, and, and I was told to follow Jesus. I was told that he, he's the one that John's been waiting for. So, I, so I've given up everything, and I'm following this guy now. Uh, John's doubting. Ooh, maybe I need to doubt too. And Jesus, Jesus is about to do something to preemptively deal with that. Let, let's take a look. Because there's something that we can start doing while, when we're waiting between the confronting of doubt and waiting for truth. There's something else that we can do in the meantime. Verse 24. After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. What did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. Let's pause there for a second. You see what Jesus is doing? He's reminding them of their past. Now, when we think about our past, there's one of two things we can do with it, right? The the first thing we can do with it is is use our past to try to develop formulas for how God works and to create a box that we can put God in, right? That's the first thing we can do with with our past. And as we're going to see in a moment, that's the wrong approach. 
The second approach to our past is to do what Jesus does, to reflect on it, to think, are there any other times in my life where I trusted in God when he did something unexpected? You see, Jesus reminds them of their whole purpose for going to John in the first place. Was it so that you could go watch grass bending in the wind? Like, did you go to have a picnic? No, of course not. You didn't just go to look at grass fluttering in the wind. You can do that anywhere. That wasn't why you went out in the middle of nowhere. Did you go out there to see a man who was dressed in luxury, who was, you know, really comfortable with his life, had a lot of wealth, was enjoying the pleasures of this world, had political power, had economic power, had social credit that he could cash in whenever he wanted? Of course not! Those kind of guys aren't in the wilderness. They're in a palace. No, you went to go see a prophet. In fact, you went to go see somebody better, greater than a prophet. Somebody who actually fulfills prophecy. You went to go find the guy who is a voice in the wilderness preparing the way for God. You see what Jesus is doing? He's reminding of them of a time when God worked in an unexpected way. God was working through John to prepare you, to get you ready for me, to call you to repentance. And you listened, you went, you responded. You heard the voice of God speaking through John and you jumped on it. You jumped on it. You see, when we look at our past, we can use it to remind ourselves of how God is growing our faith to remind ourselves of those moments when we trusted in God when he did something unexpected. And those are the things that we need to look to in our past. How has God operated in unexpected ways? Did we trust him anyway? And if the answer is yes, then that will help reorient us when we're in the midst of disorientation. And we can say, you know what, while I'm waiting for the answer, even before we are struggling with doubt, we can reorient ourselves to moments where we had faith, where we put trust in a God who did unexpected things. But that's not where Jesus ends this teaching. You see, we've been reminded that when God does unexpected things, we confront him with our doubt, we wait for his truth, then we embrace his truth. And in the meantime, we can look at our past to remind us of our growing faith and how God is growing that faith and the unexpected things that God has already done. But Jesus ends with a warning, a warning about what happens when we build a box for God. We're going to close out here. Verse 30. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected God's purposes for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. Jesus went on to say, to what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? Well, they're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other, we played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not cry. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine and you say, he has a demon. And the son of man came eating and drinking and you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by all her children. Jesus compares the people of his generation on the heels of Luke reminding us that, hey, the Pharisees and the experts in the law, the people who believe they understand God, who have no room in their theology for growth, who have built a box that God has to reside in, did not get baptized by John. They did not accept what God was doing through John. And because of that, Jesus then compares them to children, Immature children running around a marketplace. Probably, I, I get this, you get the sense that it's like when there's a funeral procession coming through or when there's like a, perhaps a king coming through and there's music that accompanies this group of people, right? Either music of mourning to call, to call people to sadness with everyone else or music of joy to call people to celebration. And in the midst of all of this, joy and mourning, you have children running around and teasing each other. Ha ha, you're playing a happy song and I'm not dancing. Ha ha, you're playing a sad song and I'm not grieving. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Jesus says you're immature. (laughs) So often it's the people who put God in a box who look like they have a very pious, put-together faith, 
And yet Jesus is saying, you, have, you, you, you are like little children. And you're not responding to the things God is doing among you. You're not responding proper, uh, properly or appropriately to what God is doing. John came with a dirge. Okay, John came calling you to repent, calling you to die to your old way of life. He came declare, he came with piety. He didn't come eating and drinking. He was eating honey and locusts in the middle of nowhere, right? Like wearing camel's hair. John was singing the dirge and you didn't respond. You mocked him for it. You called, you, you called him out saying, he's got a demon. Jesus shows up and he's being incredibly inclusive and he's inviting people to participate. And he, yeah, he's out having a good time and celebrating and rejoicing because the kingdom of God is here, but it's not yet. The time of complete renewal isn't here, but I'll give you a taste of the kingdom. I'll give you some of the new wine. And you call him a drunkard and a glutton. In other words, it wouldn't matter how God is seeking to engage with you. Because if it doesn't fit the box, you don't have the maturity to embrace it. If it doesn't fit the box, you don't have the maturity to embrace it. You see, there's a warning here. As we're engaging with a God who does unexpected things, there is a warning to make sure that we're not putting God in a box. I was reminded uh, last week during a uh, conference that that, that, uh, pastors in the denomination have been attending that our theology, there has to, it has to change every once in a while. It has to grow and develop based on the encounters we're having with God. And if it's not growing and developing, that's a problem. <laughs> it's a problem because it probably thinks we're being, it probably means that we're too prideful. We think we've got it all together. We think we've figured it out. We have no need for God in his unexpected ways. And that puts us in jeopardy because that means, I want to draw your attention to a warning that Jesus gave earlier. That means... Jesus is going to make us stumble. Jesus is going to make us stumble. Do you you remember what he said to to John's disciples? (laughs) Blessed blessed are those who do not stumble on account of me. He's using that word blessed, that, that language of new wine again. You're going to experience something good from God if I don't make you stumble. But the Pharisees and the religious elite were stumbling because of Jesus. Because they had a box for God. And they refused to repent. They refuse to repent. May we not be like them. May we not have hard hearts. May we have soft hearts that are willing to engage with God when he does the unexpected. And when he does with the unexpected, we have to go to him with our doubts. We have to confront him with our doubts. And as we confront him with our doubts, we wait for his truth. And when we receive his truth, we embrace that truth. And when we embrace that truth, in the midst of moving from doubt to doubt to truth to truth, we look back to our past to remind ourselves of how God grows our faith through the unexpected things he does. Let's take a moment and pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that you are a God who you, scripture describes as trustworthy and true whose character does not change, and yet you take joy and pleasure in doing unexpected things in this world and doing things we could never anticipate. And we praise you for that, Lord. We thank you for that. And Father, as you do unexpected things in our midst, may we have eyes to see it and ears to hear it and hearts to accept it. May we be willing to engage with our doubts, to confront you with our doubts, And then wait for your truth. And then allow that truth to reorient us back to you. Help us see the boxes that we're holding on to. And help us put them aside. Destroy them. Get rid of them. Repent of them. So that we can embrace the new thing that you are doing even now. As we wait for the day when you will renew all. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are a good God and a great God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. That's all for today. Uh, God bless you all. And uh, yeah, I pray that the peace of God will accompany you in in this week to come.